So my name is Erica Hayasaki, and I'm an assistant professor in the Literary Journalism Program here at UC Irvine. Um, the Literary Journalism Program is an undergraduate degree program in the English department. And many of you have never, maybe never heard of the term literary journalism, so I just wanted to explain what that is briefly. Um, it also goes by names like creative nonfiction, literary nonfiction, narrative nonfiction, but essentially what we do in our program is teach and practice and study the art of literary journalism, which essentially adopts from the techniques of fiction, some of the finest techniques of fiction, such as um, character development and plot development and scene setting, um, story arc, and details that make a story come alive on the page. So we take these elements and we apply them to true storytelling, um, but always keeping in mind that we have to remain true to the heart of journalism, which is to stick to the facts, to make sure that everything that we report is true, or as true as we can report it out. Um, every quote has to have a source. Every um, detail has to have a source, whether it's the color of the sky or what somebody was feeling in a particular moment, all of those elements are reported out, and that's what makes literary journalism unique. I want to talk today about the future of literary journalism. Um, we are in a moment now, I think, uh, where literary journalism, the craft, has really shifted and changed, particularly in the last five years. And that ha that's because of the digital age. There's been you know, the emergence of e-reading and websites and new platforms that have emerged. Before I actually get to the future of literary journalism, I just want to take a step back to the past, to 1946, to talk about um, one of the most famous pieces of literary journalism, which was John Hersey's Hiroshima. It ran in The New Yorker. It was about 31,000 words, and it took up an entire edition of The New Yorker at the time. Um, John Hersey is a writer that we teach in this program and our students study because that article, that long form article, became a book. And what he did is he went back to survivors of the atomic bomb. Um, he went to Japan and interviewed many of these survivors and reconstructed um, their journeys, the aftermath of the bombing. And then he was able to weave these stories together into a long form narrative. 31,000 words is a really long uh, piece of reporting. And so you won't often open up a magazine and find 31,000 words of reported literary journalism. But it was in the decades after that more and more writers like this emerged, people that you might have heard of before, um, Gay Talese, Tom Wolfe, Susan Orlean, um, Adrian Nicole LeBlanc, Tracy Kidder. These are all the people who have really pioneered literary journalism. In many newspapers, for example, the serial narrative was something that was quite popular for a long time. Serial narrative means that over the course of perhaps five days, a newspaper would run a narrative story. And every day, the front page maybe would be devoted to this long-form narrative piece. Um, a reporter would have spent perhaps a year or more on this story. The newspaper would have invested a lot of financial resources into this story, not only allowing the reporter to have a year or more to do a piece like this, but also um, the travel expenses involved, the reporting expenses involved, um, and the space. Space in a newspaper, space in a magazine is precious because it costs money. It takes the place of advertising dollars that um, really go toward funding journalism. So. This was the history of literary journalism in its heyday. It was, a, it was something that publications like the New Yorker, like the LA Times, the New York Times, and on and on, invested in to create these wonderfully told stories that were important and richly reported, but also read oftentimes with the kind of excitement and investment, emotional investment that you might find when you read a short story or a nonfiction piece. In 2009, the number of newspapers in America actually dropped by 14 percent. You saw newspaper staffs getting slashed in half, many layoffs, closures. Magazines were closing at a rapid rate as well. Um, it seemed to the world that print was dying. And so for many of us who practice long-form journalism, um, 
literary journalism. We were very worried about the future of, of, of the craft. Um, you not only saw magazines and newspapers uh, cutting resources, but bookstores were closing all over the place. Um, for example, you know, you can go online and find a, uh, a series of photos that was, it was, they were published by Business Insider of depressing bookstore closures all over the country, just photographs of bookstores closing, whether it was Borders or the indie bookstore on your block. So we didn't know what to think. We didn't know where the future was going to lead us. Um, in fact, another study actually found that in some of the major newspapers, um, stories that were long, over 2,000 words, um, were less frequently published than they were a decade ago. So the story length was actually shrinking in some cases. So length doesn't necessarily equate to great literary journalism. You can have a piece of literary journalism that's short. You can still have characters and dialogue and emotion in a short story. But what length do has allowed with pieces like Hiroshima and others um, is the time for a writer to you know, develop a character over many pages to unfurl a storyline, to create scene setting, and to create cliffhangers and twists and turns within a long-form narrative story. And that was something that many felt was going to go away. Um, and then around 2009, 2010, something changed, something shifted. This was um, really primarily a shift in how people were reading. There was a change. More and more people now than ever were reading on their e-readers, on their smartphones, on their tablets, and soon their iPads. And in fact, studies of people who had shifted to e-readers um, or had purchased e-readers found that many of these people were actually reading more when they had e-readers. For example, if you have your smartphone with you at all times, when you're in line trying to get your coffee, when you're you know, waiting for the bus, when you're on the bus, when you're you know, you've just put your children to bed and you're in, in bed and you want to quickly finish the chapter, you can just reach for your phone and read that now. And so that was a shift in how we actually read that was occurring. So, of course, tech companies came along and they were thinking about how people were changing their re reading habits with smartphones and, and tablets and iPads. And they created some apps and programs that actually made that experience better for us, easier for us to read. And one of these was actually, um, it's called Flipboard. This is my iPad, and this is my Flipboard. Your Flipboard is your personal magazine. Flipboard ac actually allows you to pull from all of your favorite websites, for example. So let's say I love reading The Atlantic, and I love reading um, you know, climatechange.org, and I love reading Politico, whatever those sites might be. It allows you to pull from all of those various websites and it creates your own personalized magazine essentially. So whether it's on your phone or a tablet or wherever, you can flip through the pages of these publications that you love. And so that was one app that made the reading experience maybe even more enjoyable for some people. Another one that's come along is called Pocket. Pocket um, is wonderfully convenient because it's an app that has that you have on your phone, again, on your iPad or your computer, and they're all connected. And it allows you to very easily save something that you're reading, save a page, and suddenly now it's on your Pocket app. And you can access these readings anywhere, even with or without an internet connection. So let's say I've saved five long-form articles that I didn't have time to finish when I found them. Next time, if I'm on the plane and I don't even have an internet connection, I can still download, go into my pocket, and read um, one of these stories and finish it on the plane. And so that's another program that has made it really easy for reading. So the reading experience has changed, and therefore, long-form journalism, the way we read it, has also changed. It's not just flipping through your newspaper or your magazine anymore. And people who have e-readers and smartphones are often reading more on these phones and e-readers and iPads. So of course, as companies came along to change the reading experience for you know, people who are pulling from websites that are already out there, the next thing that happened was, um, well, one, it, one shift in particular, one 
one thing, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the next thing that happened that added to you know, this rising popularity of literary journalism in the last several years was the creation of two more companies. One was called Long Form, and the other was called um, Long Reads. And these two companies emerged right around the same time, 2009 and 2010, really as kind of social sharing networks, finding some of the best literary journalism, the best long form journalism, um, literary journalism including essays, personal re reported essays, um, narratives that immerse into a world, travel memoir, travel writing, um, you know, all kinds of various crime stories and whatever might fall into the to the, uh, under the umbrella of literary journalism. They found these great stories every day, every week, and started sharing them with an audience. And this became wildly popular. Today you'll find that they have thousands and thousands of followers on their Twitter accounts and everywhere else. Um, Longform has a very popular podcast, which they have, they interview writers of literary journalism and reporters and editors every week and share those stories with audiences to talk about how this kind of work is done. And their long form, for example, also has an app that's kind of like a library of stories of literary journalism that you can access at your fingertips at any time. So all of this has helped make, in a sense, literary journalism, which is now often referred to as long form journalism now, um, kind of cool, cool for the younger generation, which, you know, people who can share it on Twitter, you know, these sites are reviving stories that ran decades ago. The next thing that happened then, again around the same time period, all in the period right after 2009, I would say, is we saw companies emerging specifically to produce and publish works of long form literary journalism and bring those out to the world. So a couple of these companies, um, and there's many now, but uh, one that I might, there are several that I'll mention today. Um, narratively as a site that is, it started in New York City and um, the founders wanted to bring an audience a long-form literary journalism story or not just long-form some sort of feature story every day and those features could also be documentaries they could be photo essays but five days a week a new story is produced under a particular theme kind of like um, maybe a This American Life style where you have a theme and several different stories speaking to that theme uh, another site that emerged was the Big Round Table, which uh, was launched just for reported narratives. Um, there's a site called Vela um, for women writers, and they are now doing long-form journalism, perhaps one of the most successful um, of these new publications, these new web-based publications that are devoted to literary journalism, I think would be The Atavist. Um, the Atavist was formed again around that same time period, 2009-2010, um, strictly to, at the beginning, to publish these reported pieces of long-form journalism. And what was different about the Atavist, though, is that they actually incorporated elements of multimedia into their pieces. So you could be reading a long-form reported essay or story, and within the text you might have um, video footage emerged of an interviewer with a subject in the story, or you might have um, music in the background. They did a piece about a jazz musician, and some of the music would run in the background while you're reading this book, this ebook, or short, short ebook, long form journalism piece. Um, photos embedded into stories, or when you hover over a word, you might have a photo of the person that you're writing about come up, or that you're reading about come up. Um, you know, maps that are interactive. So many different elements, audiobook features. And so, so this made the, the Atavist actually different, I think, from the rest. Um, and also that they were doing, they were doing ambitious narrative journalism, the kind of reporting that takes time and money. Um, they were able to grow, particularly by also um, allowing other companies to use this app, which was very creative. And now they have a version of the app called Creativist, which is open to all of us, which is open to anyone who wants to publish a piece and use the various features, which are pretty easy to use. I've had students use these features um, when designing their own stories. And so um, I think that you know, the Atavist is what I definitely want to mention. And I'll pause here because I want to show a clip from the Atavist as well. 
And you'll notice um, in the clip that uh, in some stories, for example, they experimented with the story telling itself, you know, the prologue rather than being written um, in some cases is actually video footage. So that's, that's, a, that's an example of how the process of storytelling, the actual writing and creating of a story also can shift in the digital age, you know, by having video do some of the work of what um, the words alone might have only done before. And then of course there are the online sites that have been around for a while and have built their brands like BuzzFeed, you know, which became wildly popular for listicles and celebrity news and cat photos. That's what everybody always likes to say. But BuzzFeed is now heavily um, investing in quality journalism, long-form journalism, investigative journalism, hiring writers and editors, and producing this kind of work, the kind of work that you would before maybe only find in places like um, you know, the Wall Street Journal or Washington Post. Um, that is what they are working toward. There are web-based sites like Matter, which began as a science publication and now has evolved into kind of a pop culture um, magazine on the web. Many of these new ventures have you know, pioneered this kind of uh, online experience that's beautifully designed and clean. You know, when I was a reporter at the LA Times, um, I left in 2009, right around this time of crisis. And, you know, back then, if I was to write a long story, um, reading it on the web meant clicking through maybe like 15 or 20 times to get to the end. And with the emergence of these sites, you found that the design changed. You found that um, a long story might be in one long scroll with photos in the background and kind of an interactive experience and, 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 and simplified and no more clicking. Um, and that has changed and I think that started with some of these sites coming along um, and, and producing pieces like this. But it also changed within places like the LA Times and the New York Times and elsewhere. Um, now you'll find a long form story is just as beautifully designed with one long perhaps scroll through and photos in the background, but it's always a balance. And I think that um, one of the most famous examples of this is the Snowfall piece, which ran in the New York Times. And this was a Pulitzer Prize winning story. Um, a reporter went and reconstructed um, uh, an avalanche and told the stories of these, um, of, these ma of these climbers who were kind of overtaken by the av avalanche and spent many, a long time reporting these pieces, talking to many people. Um, uh, it was about a 20,000 word story. And um, what was particularly significant about this piece is that it had an amazing design. Um, I mean, we're talking about, you know, you could see on screen, you could follow the route of every climber. You could see, you know, snow blowing across the screen as you read the piece. There was there were video clips with all these survivors embedded within the story. There were interactive maps. I mean, it was just such a production. And it won a Pulitzer Prize. Um, and it opened up an interesting debate. I, I assign this story often in my classes. I teach digital narrative storytelling. And one thing that I do is I, I'll tell half the class to read the Snowfall version online, on the web, with all of these great bells and whistles. And then I'll tell the other half of the class to read the stripped down version. Just read the version with, you know, no photos, no videos, nothing. None of the special stuff. And then they come to the class and they discuss their reading experience. And what I find is really interesting, I find that the students who read the stripped down version have many critiques to bring to the writing, which is always great in a writing workshop. They, they, um, they have lots to say and lots to critique with whatever story I bring them, Pulitzer Prize winning or not. Um, but then the students who come to the, to the class who have just read the online version with the multimedia bells and whistles and video and everything, um, oftentimes I find they are so in love with the story, they have almost forgotten about the written word. In fact, some of them don't even have any critique for the written word because they were so immersed in the online storytelling. So what happens is I see this debate between whether this, you know, you know, was a great work of literary journalism or whether the bells and whistles and took away from the actual reading experience. And I think that's an interesting discussion and I think that's something that a lot of the um, publications that are now creating this kind of work are thinking about because 
the debate in the journalism world became, so should we snowfall every story and when is it too much? You know, just because you have the technology now, just because a lot of people can now add in and all of you who want to write perhaps can even go to an app like Creativist and create your own stories, um, does it mean you have to add in everything? And at, one point do, at what point do you become redundant in storytelling? At what point are you just adding more layers to complicate a story? And at what point are you um, really enriching the narrative experience? One other media outlet that I wanted to discuss in this changing era is Amazon. Amazon has become such a um, hotly debated company. And one thing that they've done that has been particularly interested to, interesting to those of us in literary journalism is they created this program, again, back in 2009-2010, um, called Kindle Singles. And Kindle Singles actually is marketed through the Amazon store. And Kindle Singles are devoted to that length of the 10,000 to 30,000 word story. So again, going back to that Hiroshima length story um, that, you know, to this day is still rare to find in a magazine or a newspaper. This storefront is just for long form stories like this in that, in that space. So not long enough for a book, probably too long for a newspaper or magazine article. And many of these pieces are fiction and some of them are memoir, but a good per percentage of them are also reported literary journalism. And um, when they started the storefront, I don't know what they expected, but w what happened is that um, they initially found tremendous success in selling these Kindle singles. And um, a lot of these pieces are structured similar to maybe a novella. So, um, you know, again, you're not trying to sustain the reader for an entire book, but you still need the elements of tension and cliffhangers and story development and character development to make a, a piece that's 10 to 30,000 words really work as a readable experience. So this is another company that's really changed changed the landscape of literary journalism. And you'll find places like The Atavist, for example, that market through um, Kindle singles, as well as through the Apple um, iBook store and, the, you know, Barnes and Noble's Nook. Um, another company that has come about recently is called Decca, and they are actually a collective of international journalists who um, launch this company together and they edit each other's work and um, market each other's work, and some of that marketing takes place through the Kindle Singles store. So Kindle Singles has um, really had a, an impact on this field as well. For all of the criticisms, I would say, that have been leveled against um, Snowfall, for example, for, um, you know, whether it's the criticism of the writing style or too much multimedia, one thing to keep in mind and to really appreciate about that piece is the investment that the New York Times put into it, how much money. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, these stories are costly. And I think one thing that it's exciting as we see the field of literary journalism changing to have all these new publications and new outlets and, and to, have, to open up the world of writing to people beyond um, maybe even just longtime journalists, people who want to really try this and practice this craft. There are now more places than ever than to publish. Um, but can everybody actually do this if they don't have that budget, like the New York Times budget? How can we still produce quality literary journalism, Hiroshima-style literary journalism, in these new outlets if the funding is not the same? And I think that's, that still has not been um, worked out in the, in the world of the web. Um, writers who are writing for some of these new publications aren't necessarily getting uh, compensated for the travel or, or paid the amount um, needed for the time investment that goes into the piece. And some of these places perhaps don't have the editing staff or um, the copy editing staff um, to, or the design staff to put together a piece as um, elaborate as Snowfall or as heavily reported as Hiroshima. And these are the risks, I think, as we see more and more of these sites emerge. Um, there is a worry that the quality will go, will, will perhaps be sacrificed in some cases. Um, you know, when you don't have the time to report a scene and all of the facts in the scene, um, will that create more opportunities or chances for writers to maybe 
fudge the details a little bit. This is something you have to worry about if you have less editors and less um, accountability and perhaps less time and money for a piece like this. Um, you know, so accuracy, ethical questions, um, you know, just grammatical errors, and of course just the, the, the art of the storytelling itself. So in this program we're always talking about the story arc, you know, the long form story, the tension in the beginning, how these stories progress. Um, just because a story is 10,000 words in a Kindle single or anywhere else, is it a phenomenal read? You know, is it um, gripping? And is it, does, is it capturing your attention through that entire reading experience? And those things take time to learn and they take editors, they take great editors and editors who have worked on this kind of stuff. So I think that's a challenge as we move into the digital age, as we see more and more of this work, um, will the quality be the same? Now, that being said, places like The Atavist and um, other publications, but particularly The Atavist I want to mention because they recently won a National Magazine Award. Um, there's been many awards given to some of these publications, and I think that that's relevant because this work is being recognized, and much of it is as high quality as places like the New York Times, Esquire, and the New Yorker. But there's still an imbalance, and that's a discussion that we're still having. I've given you a brief overview of literary journalism today in the digital age and how it's changing. It's exciting, I think. Um, it's wonderful to see all these new platforms emerge and to hear from so many writers who are doing this kind of work, who love this kind of work. It's for somebody like me who um, is very passionate about literary journalism and feature story, telling. Um, it's wonderful to see these conversations open up to the, the mainstream public. Um, I think that the future of literary journalism is bound with the web. It's, you know, these two are n inseparable now. And so the question will be, how can we maintain the foundation of literary journalism, which is accuracy, great storytelling, um, and good ethics uh, as we move forward? Um, with the online world of literary journalism. And these are the questions that we'll continue to discuss in our program and in um, our classrooms. So thank you so much for joining us.